Quels sont les outils juridiques What are the legal and economic tools available to states to defend biodiversity and allow its adaptation to global change? In the standard economy, environmental issues are created by the fact that the elements of the environment are common goods that have no owner and that have no price. The price, of course, is the major economic basis for decisions. So there's an externality when uh, the well-being of an agent is affected by the activity of an other agent without any financial counterpart. So how can these externalities be internalized? How can uh, this environmental damage be brought into the market? First of all, one needs to define property rights because you cannot go into a market if you do not have the ownership of what you're going to exchange and also create institutions because the idea of spontaneous markets is uh, very rare indeed. In a non-neutral manner, involvement of the state defines both representations of biodiversity and choices between public and private interests. So in the economics of the environment, there are two major references, Arthur Pigou, considered to be the uh, father of the principle of the polluter payer, a train goes through a forest and sets fire to that forest. Uh, the state will uh, levy a tax uh, to uh, the owner of the train, from the owner of the train, to compensate the damage uh, suffered uh, by the owner of the forest. So it's the carrot and the stick, the incitation and punishment to indemnify those who have suffered and also to modify the behaviors of those who pollute. The other approach is that adopted by Ronald Coase, who says that the polluter and the polluted are on an equal footing. And sometimes private interests can be important and can be superior to public interest if there's a national a state railway company, its existence is important for society. So he analyzes pollution issues in terms of property rights, the right to pollute, the right not to be polluted. And from these theories, um, theories will come the uh, concept of uh, the carbon quotas, for instance, and the payments for environmental services, where the persons who suffer pay um, to in order for the damage to stop. The interesting thing about Ronald Coase is that these exchanges of property rights occur, or at least are supposed to occur, without any state intervention, and that the cost of transactions are very low, which, of course, um, is rarely the case. So what are the major instruments of environmental management? There's a block called command and control. It's the uh, regal powers of the state, authorizations, licenses, uh, public policies, uh, institutional ar arrangements, taxation, the carrot and the stick, controls and standards, compensations, and then geographical indications, or the creation of protected areas in the environment. There's also a whole set of legal instruments, international conventions, uh, which are transcribed into national legislation once adopted. The second type of instrument is, uh, are the economic instruments. There are financial exchanges uh, uh, government from the, on the governmental side, uh, taxes, uh, uh, fines, uh, incentive uh, credits and so on and also a financialization of environmental goods to give value and create markets for immaterial goods. For instance, it sounds rather strange uh, that there should be a carbon market because carbon is worthless. It is a, a waste byproduct of the industry. But if you consider that one of the objectives of the Climate Convention is to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases, um, it makes sense. There's also the issue of genetic resources. We create markets based on goods from the environment. There are also the stock exchanges of environmental assets where there are transactions of rights to pollute in the Brazilian law. For in Brazilian law, for instance, someone who 
deforested uh, illegally must uh, buy a, uh, an environmental right-of-way on, on, on an existing forest. So you can pay for environmental services. Uh, Vitel, for instance, pays farmers uh, in order for them to modify their farming practices to avoid polluting uh, the uh, sources of mineral water. A third set of instruments would be the uh, volunteering instruments, where their civil societies, uh, civil society initiatives would be encouraged. We have uh, the commitments and uh, codes of conduct, um, all everything that's known as soft law that has no uh, actual legal power, like the um, bond guidelines, uh, where uh, that describes uh, the exchange of genetic material. And also a large number of brands and private standards, the ISO standards, the FSC, the Forestry Stewardship Council, uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable supply of wood, the slow food movement, which pays attention to the social value of uh, uh, food, the RSPO, a certificate uh, for sustainable palm oil and all of the fair trade uh, labels that you're all familiar with. I'd like to discuss more precisely the law for the reconquest of biodiversity, nature and landscapes, because I think it, uh, it is a, a good way to reflect uh, the instruments available to the state. It's a recent, recent legislation, August 8, 2016, uh, based on uh, principles such as the uh, reparation of environmental prejudice. Previously, it was only um, natural persons who uh, could suffer a prejudice, but now a river can actually go to court. There's also environmental solidarity, a very new notion, um, a very deep change in the relationship of society and the environment in the sense that it's an eco-focused uh, approach rather than an anthropocentrist approach. Then there's the non-regression of environmental legislation. You cannot enforce laws uh, that uh, offer lower environmental protection and also the creation of the French Agency for Biodiversity. There are two key points developed in this uh, legislation. Uh, one of which is the principle of compensation, the uh, final moment of the sequence of uh, emit, reduce, compensate. When RFF, the French rail network, uh, creates new uh, railway lines in a natural reserve, uh, the first one would be to avoid, the second one would be to reduce the damage, and then if it's really impossible, and if it's in the public interest, they will need to compensate. And there are several ideas here that there is no net loss. Compensation means uh, that there must be a benefit to biodiversity. It's not uh, simply preserving the forest. You need to restore deteriorated zones. And that creates the status of, the, uh, of a compensation operator, uh, people who are going to be restored deteriorated sites with these biodiversity units that they gain can allow the uh, person who created the damage to uh, be fully compliant with the law. And the final point, which I think is very important, is that of the ratification of the Nagoya, Nagoya Protocol, which is included in this law for the reconquest of biodiversity. It's uh, a protocol with constraints that's part of the Biological Diversity Convention, which regulates access to resources and the sharing of benefits. The key idea here is that those who exploit genetic resources usually do not take part in the protection of biodiversity. And second, that the suppliers of genetic resources um, either uh, bearers of traditional knowledge or the states do not receive any benefits from the industrial advances based on uh, uh, this uh, genetic, these genetic aspects. So the supplier of genetic resources must give uh, informed consent to the user and the user and supplier must sign a contract 
where the benefits are shared and where their rights and duties are defined. And the law for biodiversity also explains how this sharing of benefits uh, can be organized either in a monetary or non-monetary form. In conclusion, I would like to insist on two points. First, the multiplicity of the tools available to governments to um, interact with the environment. And second, uh, perhaps we should not focus so much on market solutions, which seem to be entirely uh, based on the support of states and are in any case minority solutions if you compare them to uh, the state's power.